So, well, it's a small group, so we can make it much more interactive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be <coughs> too much uh, theory. Um, the idea is to talk about the architecture design for interactive visualization. So, uh, there are two of us who kind of work together and teach together. My name is Amit Kapoor, and uh, I kind of work in this intersection of visual uh, data visuals and stories, so data visualization, uh, visual data science, machine learning, but kind of still trying to talk a lot about this intersection, right? And uh, my partner in crime there is Bhargav, who, uh, who has been doing data science before the term was invented, and uh, works, um, has worked across the both sides of the U.S., as well as India and uh, many different areas and currently runs a startup trying to build a recommendation system uh, product and personalization product uh, for companies and uh, for B2B sales. So, um, okay, how many have, have done any, uh, how many have made, done visualization? I'll ask the easy questions first. Okay, how, okay, that's pretty good. How many have done, uh, Interactive visualization. Um, okay, far less hands. How many have thought about how to build something as an architecture for doing interactive visualization? Uh, okay, that's great. Well, so we have a few people who have uh, also thought about it. So that's great, we can talk about it. Um, so let's take a simple example, right? Like, let's take the most basic. Uh, <coughs> Let's make the most basic data set. Uh, this is the data set on the left. It's just 15 data points, area, sales, and profit. Um, one categorical, two quantitative data points. And uh, we have a very simple interactive visualization on the right, right? We are, <coughs> uh, we have, uh, we, we have what you would call a kind of a bar chart, but really encoding area as bars, area on the x-axis, sales on the y-axis, profit as percentage as color, right? Profit percentage as color. And uh, we then also have a rule, which is the average, so the red line is the average. Uh, and then we have a brushing action that's happening. There's also a hover happening. But there's a brushing action happening when you brush, the area that's selected actually recalculates the recalculates the average, right? So whatever is the area selected in that. Now, if we were to try to unpack this, right? I mean, to try to unpack this um, visualization, we basically made, um, we first did a data transformation because we don't have profit percentage. So we needed to calculate another column, which is profit percentage. So we had one column more, which was added. And then we have two layers that we created. So two layers, literally one, which is kind of the bar chart, if you're comfortable with the chart terminology, and a rule chart. And then we layered it on top of each other. And then we linked it with some interaction so that when we're doing a filtering on the first, on the bar, it is recalculating the line on the second layer, right? So just a simple visualization requires actually multiple steps to create, or multiple steps to, um, think about. And this is a good way to think about how we can think about architecture for visualization, right? Um, so if you want to think about architecture, think of these four layers, right? So there is a data layer, there is a transform layer, there is a visual layer, and there is an interaction layer, right? So there are these four basic components that are layers that, are, that the data has to go through where, before we get into a visualization. Now, if you think of a very simple architecture, which is if you're trying to do visualization on the browser, uh, or which is this example, everything is getting done on the browser. So I'm kind of think articulating the server client architecture there. I have the data on the server, so I may have this data as a CSV, and I can do then all the subsequent elements required within this browser to do make this happen, right? So I can transform my data in the browser. I can encode it in different layers visually, and then I can also code or encode the interactions that need to happen between the layers, whether the layers are on top of each other or are composed in a dashboard 
way, right? So, but everything from the data onwards is happening on the client side, right? And this is pretty much kind of the grammar of graphics. Ooh, I think the label below has changed, but okay. <laughs> the grammar of graphics. And uh, if you look at this on the right, it is really great, this triangle. It's really flexible. I can do everything I want on the client side. It is uh, high latency or low latency in the sense I can interact with it, everything. The only challenge would be in scaling. So the data still has to come from the server. How does it go from the server to here? But once it can go there, I could probably do everything on the browser, right? So when we think about if we are okay with this architecture, is this clear? In terms of, uh, think of this as the grammar of interactive graphics, right? So grammar of interactive graphics. I think there's a previous talk talking about the grammar of graphics, which is very common if you think of uh, uh, using tools like R or Vegalite or um, D3. Uh, there is a grammar, and uh, this is the grammar of interactive graphics, right? So interaction will add some more layers to this. Selection, filtering, exploring, reconnecting, reconfiguring. And our focus is to think about how this architecture changes as we make different trade-offs, right? So everything in design is a trade-off. Uh, so we will talk about four trade-offs. Or um, one, how do we render for data scale? So as the data goes up, how can we change the rendering? So how do we scale as data changes? Uh, interaction requires uh, interactive speed. So when I interact with it, I may require some recomputation to happen. So computation for that interaction speed. Uh, if the data shape changes, how, how do we handle that? And then if the data is not static, but there is also a velocity element to it, um, how do we handle that, right? So think of point three as variety or complexity, point four as velocity as the data is changing. Yeah? So <coughs> rendering for data scale. Um, so five data points are okay, but if we have a billion or billion data points, what do we do? Right, so it's, when we have a million of data, uh, data points uh, or a large set of data points, what are our options? Because that's why we want to talk about rendering for data scale. And uh, so let's think about it. What are the options? I have this uh, points that I'm trying to render, which is about a million points. And given that the pixel on my dated MacBook Air is 1400 by 900, it's literally equal to the number of data points I, I'm trying to do, right? So if I plot it or just on an X and Y axis, I am literally over plotting, right? I can't see anything. So what are my options? What are my options? Right. Count of points at each position, okay, right? So I can take some aggregation features and do it. What else? Alpha. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> alpha, yeah, this is alpha. Um, actually, alpha doesn't do anything at this level, right? A million points with 0 0.001 alpha will also pretty much uh, be, because there's so much overplotting here, there's nothing you can, the alpha is like literally of no use, right? Yeah, so the first option is sample, right? I mean, this is a realistic way to think about this. I can always sample the data, and as long as I'm okay with my sampling techniques, I can actually <coughs> plot this really well, right? Um, third thing, we are in like an AI conference. I'm, I'm sure half of you want to build some, you know, greater new model. So obviously we can model the data, and the modeling the data obviously reduces uh, the visualization space, and it's great because modeling scales really well, and the model can be shown far more easily, but it doesn't help us address the visualization topic, which is really, I want to be able to see the data to know what is what I don't know, right? So how do, how do we do that? So typically, the most effective thing for this context is normally binning, right? So, you know, putting it into bins and using some aggregate counts to do that can actually increase, um, can make it easy for me to render Data, right? So binning actually starts to show some, some visualization, right? Uh, I, I kind of tend, tend to make the statement that visualizing data at scale is just a process of creating generalized histograms, right? I'm always trying to aggregate data in some lower buckets, and it's all about how I do it, where I make that trade-off of creating this, right? 
Uh, okay. Um, I, I haven't talked about uh, one thing in the rendering. So this is kind of getting the data in, but there's also another challenge of rendering, which is when I want to render the data, do, can my screen handle a million points when it's moving, right? Uh, so typically we render using um, DOM elements. Uh, we never use DOM elements, sorry. We use kind of scalar vector graphics, or we use raster graphics, or we want to use WebGL activate, I accelerated canvas, right? So WebGL canvas. And if you think just at the rendering of how many data points I can do, Typically, the order goes like this. I can, if I have a thousand points, I'm okay to use SVG as the rendering layer. If I am about ten thousand, maybe twenty, thirty thousand, I can go up to a canvas. And if I really want to think about a million points, I want to use um, the hardware's accelerated canvas, which is WebGL in this context, in the browser to actually do it. Right. So I may bin the data, but even in spite of binning, I may need to still think about my rendering options. Right. So one option is if I can pull in still a million data points, I can just use WebGL to plot it, right? So here's an example of using um, one option that, that people, you can experiment with is DECGL. Uh, DECGL is kind of uh, an open source project really looking at geographic mapping, and it basically uses a WebGL layer to do 2D, 3D projections on uh, on 2D, 3D projections on maps, typically, it's based on geographic. They have a little bit of non-geographic stuff. Uh, but you can really use this to do it. So moving to a WebGL architecture can really put it. Plotly, if some people use, is also able to plot a lot of data points because they seamlessly move between WebGL and other rendering options, right? Uh, here is an example that I did. Uh, I was helping someone build, uh, visualize secondary freight so how the freight is moving between different delivery points and uh, over time, so you know the points are distribution, the big logic stuff is clustered, uh, aggregated amount of how much uh, freight is going through each warehouse. Uh, the lines are basically showing routes from um, points in India, warehouse to different distribution points. And the time on a slider on the bottom is really trying to uh, show you how that changes and plays with the time horizon on that, right? So you can play around with that. So this is interaction, but still I've loaded everything in the data, in the, in the browser, and everything is happening in the browser. It's just that I have used a rendering capability which allows me to use a larger number of data points, able to handle a larger number of data points on the screen, right? So uh, the first, Detail uh, option, if you were to think about is, should I bin the data, should I summarize it, and should I use a better rendering engine if I just want to move to uh, handling data at scale, right? So I still put the data on through the, through the pipeline, but I use effective uh, visualization transformations and rendering mechanisms to do that, right? So I can increase the scale level a bit. Right, I, I may not be able to, I mean, people will come and say, can I do my six terabyte Hadoop cluster on this? No, obviously not. You know, we're talking not Hadoop clusters, but, you know, if you're realistically looking at a million points, uh, you know, 250 MB data point, 250 MB data you want to push, that's still realistic. And if you compress it, you can make it even better. Right? Uh, so the other technique, which is uh, which is another way to do to reduce, is how can I? Okay, I still want to send large data. Can I compress the data before sending it in the wire, right? So I can then actually send more data across the wire and still use the same technique to do it, right? So this uh, effective approach was called bin summarize smooth. If anybody's looked at it, uh, this was a paper by Hadley Wickham, and it basically said instead of transferring raw data, I will transfer binned, summarized, smooth, smooth data to actually uh, effectively render it, right? So I will actually move my, and this the, the paper is called Big Wiz, and the idea was really, it's also a paper, it's also a package in R. As, uh, so I move the transform layer back, and instead of actually rendering, sending in the entire data, I send only the bin summarized and smooth data across, right? So now I'm compressing the data and only sending that part. So I can actually increase the scale. Latency is still good, 
obviously flexibility goes down because now I'm making choices around when to send the data or what data goes through it, right? I can't, I can't recompute back the raw data from this, right? If anybody, uh, if you can take this approach one level more, if somebody uses Python, for example, well, if I've already been the data, I've already summarized it and smoothed it, instead of doing the visual rendering on my image, on my client side, why don't I just make the image also on the server and just send the uh, image across, right? And then just leave only the interaction part there, right? So this is the idea around data shader, uh, which basically takes this idea of saying, instead of sending compressed data, I will just send an image across, which takes it to the next step, right? So I take the image, and this is like, I think the US census, so about every person in the US rendered, and every, all the compression of the data, as well as generating the images is done on the server side, and then I translate that stuff, uh, image, and just transfer only one PNG or one, uh, literally a PNG across, right? And then I allow, build interaction capability on top of that, where the interaction is done and then the signal is sent back and a new image is sent if you zoom in or pan onto all of this, right? So I am translating everything back to the server and I'm making kind of a different trade-off. I'm moving this line further to the right here, right? Uh, so now, instead of only bin and summarizing, I also have to think about encoding options, what exactly the chart would look like, visualization would look like, and I'm sending it across this, right? This is a very effective technique for scaling. I mean, and especially for data scientists who are thinking about how do I do visualization at scale, these techniques are available in uh, R and Python, and you know, you can actually start using some of these packages. Data Shader, for example, is just a generic rendering pipeline, so you could use that as a rendering pipeline with your favorite visualization package, and just take that concept, and then use your visualization package to render it, right? So, a uh, lot of opportunity to kind of even in your notebook how to scale up, right? Uh, you obviously scale up, you get latency, good latency can be still done, uh, but it's obviously less flexible, right? So now you can't do a lot of the visual encoding changes, you have to go back uh, and recompute this and send it back out, right? Um, does that make sense in terms of these trade-offs? Uh, these are very practical approaches in terms of visualizing, if you're thinking of really visualizing data at scale, right? So if the architecture design is focused on how do I look at larger, larger scale, then these are good choices to think through, right? Um, okay, that's one dimension, one trade-off, right? The second trade-off in interaction is really interaction speed, right? Uh, when I interact with a visualization, I want an immediate feedback from the visualization. If there is more than 200 or a uh, 500 millisecond of delay, it may not be allow me to do interactive data analysis or interactive visualization, right? So if I am selecting an area or zooming into an area and it takes three minutes for the new visualization to render, then it doesn't really work out, right? Then I, I can't really do interaction, the interaction is just um, is more like a batch process than really interactive in nature, right? So there's a lot of study done on what's the latency that you need to do it. And that's another trade-off to make when we have, we're thinking about this, right? So, <coughs> and this is especially true for uh, multi, uh, let's think of it as multi, um, multi-chart layouts, right? When you're really interacting on one part of the chart and you want to see um, the representation on the other part, right? So. Uh, common example is cross-filtering. So this is an example of cross-filtering where we are filtering on some dimension, brushing on the lower part, and as we're brushing, we want to see the data represented in the other elements. So we want to see it in the map, we want to see it on the other parts, and we're really trying to understand how this looks right, right? So um, uh, one approach to this, and this is more uh, uh, just a demo, but was really can I, create these aggregation cubes and um, which allow me to do cross filtering, but I really build it on locally and allow people to cross filter really fast into this. So cross filter, the original library uh, was again built on this concept. This is much more a concept taking both the idea of cross filtering, but also using 
uh, tile generations to do it. But the idea is basically I'm aggregating the data, keeping cubes, pretty much like you would do in a database, and then using that to drive interaction faster, right? So I'm not just getting the data, I'm also creating cubes of the data or index data or hash data in a way that I can uh, cross filter them very effectively, right? And that's the one way to improve uh, latency around it, right? Um, uh, it's still happening on the client side, um, but whatever pre-aggregations I do and make, those kind of operations become faster. So I do remove my flexibility down a little bit, but I can still improve the latency uh, interaction speed on, on, on the visualization, right? This is the same idea if you were to translate on the server side, I've not talked about it, but on the server side is caching, right? So if I pre-compute all my visualizations or data in, uh, and cache that data set, and then I'm only sending a very small amount of data set, I could actually get interaction speed just from the server side, but now using cached data as opposed to memory cubes, right? So that's another way to think about this trade-off of interaction. Um, another technique um, which, is, uh, which is interesting to try, especially those who have larger data and you want to do interactive speed is approximate querying. So approximate querying would basically mean if I want to interact with a chart and I want an answer correctly, uh, it may take a long time. But if I have an approximate query engine on top of my data base or in the middle of the database, think of it as a middleware, I get an eventually consistent answer, eventually consistent answer, but initially I get an approximate answer, which is pretty much like sampling. So sampling my database to get an answer for that query. Uh, and it can be up to 50 times faster than the actual one. So this is great for if you're really dealing with large data sets, which luckily I don't, but a lot of people want to interact with, you know, terabytes of data, then approximate querying can be one way to do it. From a visualization point, so there are two challenges. From a database point, you need to figure out how to implement an approximate query engine in the middle. From a visualization challenge, uh, it also has one additional challenge. So now I'm querying the approximate result and getting some results. So I'm doing the transformation on the server. Everything else is on the client. It is still really fast. I can do interaction really well. But what is the challenge of visualization is that now I'm getting an approximate result. So I need to find a way to show this uncertainty in my data, like we would show on a projection. And in a projection, now again, you have to think about how to show the uncertainty that eventually my data is this answer, but currently you're seeing an approximate version of it. So the visualization challenge normally using approximate engines is how do I, how do I, I lose one more encoding channel because I have to think about how to show with uncertainty on the results also, right? So that makes it a much more harder question to do. For, for a very uh, basic command, the standard source is just following that approximate error sort of adds up as a projection and so on. So uh, the uh, one way to think about is is basically sampling. So suppose I'm trying to um, I'm trying to minima, find a minimum value within my one column, and I want to get that value, right? Now, if I have, want to scan the entire database, I will probably need a longer time to do it. Let me sample the column intelligently and show you an answer, and also the range of likelihood of that. So instead of getting one answer, I'll probably get a, like, a, a mean answer and the range. Right? And yes, eventually the system will, can calculate given enough time, but if you're focused on interaction, does the analyst or does the business user seeing an approximate result, can he start making decisions for, which are as good as saying eventually consistent, right? And that is a different trade-off. I mean, if really you want to do large interaction at scale, but also have interaction speed, then this is one approach to do it. The other approach is obviously what we talked about as in-memory cubes or caching, right? So caching is an alternate way to do it in the sense I cache the data then, then I may not have the most precious data, but I'm kind of caching it. So the linkage to kind of the data layer becomes much, much, much stronger here, right? The third approach, if you want to think about this or more approach, is really use a faster database, right? So if I, if my, Challenge is I don't want to do caching, I don't want to do pre-computes, then can I just use a faster database to do it? And so GPU database that some of them are, are kind of 
thinking about in terms of high, uh, really low latency uh, database. This is um, MapD, an example from MapD, and it's open source. At least the uh, the database part is open source, so you can actually use it. Uh, and the visualization is basically sending an image in this case. So, but because the database itself is GPU, it is not really sending an image. It is really sending me directly the GPU vectors, and I'm plotting the GPU vectors itself, right? So I can actually make this really faster if I can get my querying happen very faster. And this is, I think, a large tweet database. And uh, I am able to interactively analyze and scan through it and look through the results, right? So getting interaction speed on larger data is not as simple. You will have to make some choices. And that's what you know, architecture design in, in a lot of ways thinking about this, right? So I'm getting faster responses, but literally doing all the transformation and visual encoding on the server side. But in this case, the server is actually literally a GPU, right? So it's doing a GPU uh, computation and pushing in this side. I can get, uh, it can be highly flexible, very low latency, scale. Um, so it looks like this is the golden solution, but I missed one number dimension, which is really how much data can I really store on the GPU and kind of the cost of doing this, right? So it may not be most effective for all your data, but it may be really effective for uh, your data that is really mission critical and you want to operate on it. So operational database and really looking at fast insights from it, right? So if you add the cost dimension to it, the amount of memory dimension, it'll make you a difference, right? Okay, so far okay? Any questions? Okay. Uh, how do we think about complexity? So uh, this is the third challenge, right, uh, which is in visualization. It's easy to make visualizations when your data does not, uh, is very static, and I make it once, and I know everything that's there in the data set. But if my data is, is actually uh, not only static, but it changes in variety, or it has some other characteristic which make it harder for me to visualize how to handle this, right? Um, one approach is um, really thinking about responsive visualization to space and data, right? So this is really, uh, um, it's much more on a rendering challenge, but the idea is effectively talking about my visualization can adapt itself depending on the size of the visualization space that I have, as well as the number of data points that I'm doing, right? So it's not a scatter, but as the data goes up, I can actually go to a heat map and add even further. If the data goes, keeps going up, I can go to a contour map and really go forward in it. So it's really adaptive to the space and data that is there. There are a few libraries that do that right now, um, but it, it requires much more uh, link custom coding at the moment, I guess, to get more responsive data visualization. But I'm really adapting my chart space to more data points. More data points, different visualization, not just the same visualization. So there is another dimension to the encoding, which is the number of data I have. Or in, it could also be the size. The same thing rendered on mobile looks different to the same thing rendered on a desktop. So it adapts also and changes the visualization depending on the format that is uh, I think I showed this in the morning, but um, there are a number of experiments also to think about how to handle cardinality, right? So data number is one, but high cardinality is also a big problem. In, and cardinality basically means uh, a number of categories in a particular column. So if I'm doing categorical data, if I have five categories, it's okay to show, but as my data goes and becomes more cardinal, uh, more categories, I need to have tools that can actually show, summarize others, as is happening in this case. So there is another bucket here, uh, which is dynamically computed and adapts itself to the visualization that I'm trying to do. So it's binning on the fly, and I'm really trying to look at that, right? Uh, the third is another way to think about cardinality is really change how we look at data. Um, so if energy is played with tab plots in R, um, or uh, really thinking about data in a very different way. So this is combing through my data. Um, 
it is a big table, but it is encoded, visualized, and as I scale through the data, I can actually start to look at each values, I can group stuff, I can start to, so I can actually handle large amount of data variety, but allowing at the same time to interactively uh, work through it and learn about it, right? So I'm both visualizing, summary features, um, plus interactively going through and I can start to see the patterns within each columns if I am, right? So the moment you have visualization which has high cardinality, which has high, uh, high variety uh, or can change in size dramatically, you have to think of different alternatives. A lot of this is not easily available in tools and that's again a decision you have to make whether it's worth building this in your architecture or not, right? Um, Yeah, I mean, the other approach obviously is thinking about dimensionality reduction. Um, uh, there are two ways to think about dimensionality reduction. Uh, one that is typically used in business, which is basically faceting the data or, sorry, looking at the data in smaller, smaller viewpoints, so it's multiple layers as you do it. That's why we have all our dashboards are like this set of rectangles that we have because we're trying to handle multi-dimensional data. The other from machine learning end is really thinking about whether my data can be visualized in a different way and using projections to do it. So projections is one approach, interaction is another approach, and if projection applies, then I can think of that as a way to do it, right? Okay, uh, last trade-off. I mean, this one is a, uh, a relatively an easy one, which is the uh, velocity one. So if my data is really moving, how do I, think about this, right? So if my data is refreshing at a rapid pace, um, how do I handle you know, real time or near real time data or refreshes uh, in it? I think I only have one example of this, um, which is, um, I think this is one of the original time series visualization, uh, very common pattern now. Uh, this was from Cubism, I guess, Cubism, and it is really looking at uh, from a visualization context, it's not really hard. And data handling context, actually streaming data is much more easier to handle than any of the other data. Because the data that I'm handling at any time is fixed, and I'm mostly adding one data point and dropping one more data point, if I'm really ha handling streaming data point. The data point happens, the visualization challenge becomes harder for real time or streaming data is when, when I want to actually store large amount of data. But if I'm only looking at a fixed window of data, then visualization mostly ends up being a slightly easier way and I'm only trying to uh, visualize the, the last n window or the last 10 minute window and the visualization just means shifting data and it becomes actually not that hard to do it. Um, okay. Um, I guess this also reflects I haven't done enough on this area so maybe there are more challenges to do this. Uh, but, um, yeah, so um, thinking about interactive visualization is great. We don't have tools to, that allow us to do a lot more that we would like to do, um, both in terms of just creating that first simple chart that I showed at the start of the um, start of the talk, uh, to then trying to build products in our uh, where we will have different trade-offs that we want to do. So my advice is really to think about um, more and more easier client-side solutions if you can initially before you start to think about uh, more harder solutions on the server side. Um, so a lot of possibilities are there as I talked about for data scale and computation on the client side. And when you feel like that does, does not give you the right trade-off, you can think about what other trade-offs I want to make in the server side to do that, right? Interactive visualization at scale is not removed from my architecture design around database or what I choose on the raw data and transfer, right? I mean, if that, that linkage is really strong, if you have made choices on the front end in terms of how you render it, what libraries you use, how adaptive they are, there are again same choices you have to make in terms of caching and uh, transformations or faster databases on the back end to really do interactive data visualization, right? So this spectrum requires kind of thinking about both these trade-offs. Yeah? 
Um, okay, I think I went at a rapid pace, but this is what I have. Um, we still have some time. Um, any questions, thoughts, people who have done this stuff and build products or build, will walk through these trade-offs if they have questions or thoughts they would like to share. We probably have a mic also. So in your experience, in your experience, what do you feel uh, in terms of, I'll uh, go away from the approach because you really cleared that up, uh, the tools and techniques which work better for you rather than some places which you always go back to, like some tools you go back to or some ideas you go back to again and again? Um, so I think it depends a bit on my context, right? So my context is both in terms of teaching this stuff as well as mostly handling smaller data, right? Um, so my biases towards tools that are, is pretty much the first slide that I do, that I want just the data and everything I want to do uh, uh, kind of on the client side or the tool able to do, handle it. And on client side, I, I don't really mean client side, but I, since I'm dealing with small data, I'm comfortable handling everything in memory or in, in, in that. So that kind of biases a lot of my trade off a lot of my, uh, my usage. In terms of tools, you know, I, I think I'm not very different from most data scientists, I would say. You know, if, if I'm using the R universe, you know, the tidyverse universe is what I would use. Again, interaction options are really not that great in R. Uh, or they are great, but they're all bolted on top, mm -hmm. like through HTML widgets. So, uh, which means they're great for single charts, but if you want to get um, crosstalk, as they call it, and get multiple charts to work, then they're harder, and then you have to basically adopt like a dash, dashboard Shiny. framework like Shiny to do it. Um, Python universe is actually pretty much more harder. My bias there is Altair right now because that's an offshoot of uh, uh, Vega Lite, uh, Vega. So it, it allows for composition and it allows for creating a lot of these charts. Uh, but doing interactive multi dashboard at very large scale. Um, stuff like data shader and all that helps, but in that ecosystem, I think there's so many options and so many choices that it's uh, hard to pick one and just go deeper in it. You ultimately end up picking smaller stuff to do it. And a lot of this stuff is not hard. Uh, a lot of this stuff is hard, right? Even though uh, I think the Anaconda data shader kind of thing tries to do a lot of these large scale data. Um, in the JS ecosystem, obviously, Vega D3 is what I, I kind of go back to. Um, Vega because it's kind of Vega because it's declarative and allows me to do interaction declaratively. D3 for custom stuff, P5 for kind of doing uh, generative and creative stuff. Um, yeah. Um, and trying out new, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that new things keep coming up. So at one point you would say, I want to do map visualization, I want to use leaflets and all that. But like deck.gl from Uber and you know their tool, Kepler for example, that, that I use to create that can actually do a lot of your interactive geographic visualization in the business context. And I've seen businesses adopting it uh, as part of their tools. So it is also not a standing still equilibrium. So as we start to use more of this WebGL stuff, I'm guessing we'll see new options which will make it very specific for domain specific problems. So that's another kind of, you know, keep an eye out for stuff that comes out which is really nice. Kepler is really nice if you focus just on geographic data. Yeah? Question there, huh? Yeah. Great talk, Amit. A uh, lot of insights to work on. Uh, one question would be on the mobile interfaces. How mm. do you see all these uh, efforts evolving with mobile penetration increasing drastically in terms of visualization? So I, I, I think, I mean, mobile has its, to be honest, we, we do visualization. And if you think about it, most of the stuff is optimized not for touch interface, but visual kind of mouse interfaces. So if you think about pure interaction, a lot of these examples won't really work. Uh, you know, because, so mobile requires a different way of thinking. Um, um, I think there are two things to think about there. One is adaptivity becomes much more complex. 
I kind of just talked about it in a very narrow context here, but you know, when you start designing for mobile interfaces, being adaptive to different screen sizes really brings it into focus how to think about it. That's a, also a little, little bit of a UI and design kind of imperative which overlaps with data visualization. And uh, this audience is normally not generally very uh, keen on that. Uh, so I think how to think about different sizes, how to think about touch, and most of our stuff that we use in data science actually doesn't really work well on mobile interfaces. Um, so we need to really think differently about that. Mm, I haven't done also enough work in it, but you know, Android and the, those ecosystems also don't have good libraries to do visualization stuff. So web is a good option, but make it more or mobile optimized for that trade-off. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, great talk and sharing uh, different tools. Uh, one of the, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very curious question. I'm not sure if you will have answer for that or no. Uh, many times business users feel comfortable in uh, interacting with the system with the language that they understand. Mm. Like a lot of corporates have 800 reports uh, in their whatever visualization tool that they use, correct? Mm -hmm. But nobody knows in order to get what they want, what report to click and uh, do what with that. So that's where they struggle. And the idea is to have uh, an interface wherein they could chat, I mean, where they could send message uh, to a system and message will have machine comprehension would understand, would actually convert the query which is written in English to SQL and mm -hmm. get the data out from their data source and Correct. intuitively decide what visualizations to, what visualization to show. Yeah. Uh, do you know if a, any of the tools uh, are, if anybody is really working on that uh, in, at some stage or would, could you share some examples? Of sure. Oh, wait, I mean, I, I consult or help a friend out or mentor his company and he's building something like this, but um, which kind of addresses uh, the question that you have. Uh, but the question is not a just simple question of architecture for the interactive part, right? The moment you want to um, get a natural language search based query system to generate visualization, um, what you need is first, I need to translate that into SQL query, as you said. But that's not only enough. I need a data map of all my data sets joined and have some knowledge graph built on top of that that I can use it, Good right? Enough. Yeah, that, so that part is actually harder in the business. Why businesses have 8,000 or 8 reports is that these stuff is all siloed out and not together, right? So uh, the company that um, I was referring to, Sprinkle Data, they try to kind of combine this data set, uh, build a knowledge graph on top of it, and which works really fine for, uh, you know, startups or you know, emerging companies. But I'm not saying it's an easy solution for large companies to do it, right? Um, trying to do search-based query and auto-visualization, a lot of tools have tried, right? Power BI has search-based, very very, very, very basic, right? Because what it lacks is not so much, um, it does, it does not have deep domain knowledge of that. Uh, like, I mean, this search weights query would only work once you know the entire data sets that they are in your system yeah. and you can actually do it. Uh, you can actually kind of can find all the connections and create it. The other part of then is, which is the second part to this, so this is the first challenge. The second challenge is autoviz or creating visualization automatically. Okay, so autoviz is kind of like, Given a query, can I select a visualization out of the combinatorial options that are there, right? Now again, there are a lot of, uh, you know, ways to think about this and people are researching on it. Voyager is one tool uh, which does it. Um, Draco is a new tool or is a tool that uh, from the IDL lab, Interactive Data Lab of Washington. So it's called AutoVis, right? Auto no, so the, uh, Auto, <laughs> Automatic visualization, you say. Autoviz is also a term that Leland Wilkinson uses for generating insight automatically. So can I say, tell you out of all the graphs, which two by two graph should you be looking at as a user, right? So that's also one autoviz. The second for business, automatic viz is more like, for this data set, for this question, this is the best visualization. Those are actually two separate questions as people do it. So it's best visualization. So that's again, a second problem. You have to solve both these problems 
along with what the machine learning part is. And it's easier to do it for a startup company, uh, but it's harder to do for more larger enterprises where just getting the connections itself will take you a long time before you can do this, right? But happy to talk more offline on terms of uh, other questions, other resources that we have. Yeah? Thanks so much. I think we're obviously done for time. But, okay. Uh, Thank you. Both of us are at uh, these links, so I'm just pointing that out. AmitCaps.com and Bhargav.com or Impel.io for Bhargav. Uh, go to his startup and, you know, get some recommendations. Thank you so much.